you go and talk to all the young people if they want it, let's plan it. And then we went to talk to a lot of young people and they start telling us they want to have a place for you know, young entrepreneurship, they want a place for activities, leadership program, and we plan everything and we give it to the government. And Dr. Vivian pushed, pushed it in parliament and we managed to get the place and the money to build this place. Thank you. So it, it's 10 years into this space. The building is only up this September at fourth year. Right? Before that, there's a lot of planning, the construction, the planning to make it happen. But today, and I also noticed this one is Entrepreneurship 3.0, which means you're moving faster than us. Uh, Lawrence Wong is now the Minister for Youth, and we just given the mandate last week that we're going into Skate 2.0, which is about social media, media, music, dance. Beside all the things we've done in the last few years, entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, leadership, but now we have more activities. But I really feel we have done this for 10 years. This is a time we also pass over to all of you as change makers to play a part in this space. Because this space is created for you. Because I know that by the time I finish this place, I'll be out of the age of youth. So I only have one request from government. I have an IC that says permanently youth honorary youth. So I got this that never passed 35. Youth is up until 35. So I, I'm very glad to see all of you. I'm also glad to see Play Nation. I think you're going to be part of sharing. You want to say wave hello and yeah they're one of our youth uh, you know that's upstairs here uh, Play Nation and uh, startup. Then was start, startup. Today should be quite good. Yeah? So I, I hope okay? <laughs> still startup. Patrick you have to help more. Huh? Yeah, so we really hope uh, that all of you can plan something, do something, use this space and make it yours. Because, you know, only then we can show the government that, you know, the youth are the future of Singapore. You are the future of Singapore. We support each other. We support Singapore talents. So earlier we want to say, if you have money, give money. You have talent, give talent. You have time, give time. And then you will be truly a change makers. This thing don't happen overnight. It's 10 years. Right? And then you, we have another 10 more years to go because we have 20 years for this space. Where we will go to depends on you and the next batch of you. So I hope in the next two days, you will do a lot of learning because I think earlier, I think a few weeks ago, we, I shared with some of you about 10,000 hours. Whatever you love to do, just do it for 10,000 hours and you'll be the best in it. So it'll be it photography, painting, event organizing, leading, you know, and the team, I think, I would believe uh, the JWF team have done a lot to make this happen. Uh, give them a big hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I really urge all of you to continue to live your dreams because the opportunities is unlimited today, right? And then a hashtag, JWF SG. <laughs> anyway, I saw Benjamin, he's going to be playing for you. I hope uh, we'll get the keyboard going because I met him some time back uh, I would believe he has slight disabilities. Uh, he doesn't speak very well as well. Uh, but I saw him at a social enterprise market called Simpang Budo, Kampong at Simpang Budo, and he was playing. And I thought, okay, he was re he was he's really good. And I brought my mom to the hawker center, and my mom started to sing, and he started to play with my mom and he accompanied my mom and then the key he then changed key towards my mom and my mom was enjoying himself herself in a hawker center singing and i said wow this is a talent so he's he's giving his talent today and you know we really want you to uh, you know appreciate some a talent like him appreciate people who give time talent and money as well but most important appreciate our own talents because until we realize that we have our talents, appreciate our talents, our businesses, and our people, then Singapore and all that we do can move to a new level. So I thank you again. Thank you, Prof. Wee. I adopt my own professor because I got no chance to go to universities. So I go and accept, uh, adopt my own professor. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Rick, and the team of JWF, Chairman, and all. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Patrick, thank you again. Thank you, tell the joke. Okay, I, 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 learned, I learned to tell one last joke, one All last right, joke. Sure. I learned, I learned from you, right? Okay. okay, thank you. So this is what happened, I collect toys. Uh, and one day I went to Science Center, they had a Star Wars exhibition. 
So I was looking, looking, and I saw uh, like those people dressed in Chewbacca, then Luke Skywalker, and then you have uh, Darth Vader. And then I was looking, you know, then I was like, wow, so nice to take photo with them, right? Because you have your dream. Then you see from there, they were talking to Preston Nathan. So I said, if I walk over, maybe the, the security officer will kill me or something, right? Take out the lightsaber and slash me. So I didn't dare to walk over. So I was looking and admiring from afar. And suddenly I saw Darth Vader. He was standing there. And then Darth Vader turned around. Then I can hear him coming, walking. Then he walked closer and closer and closer. Then he came out in front and go. Then he bent over. He said, are you Elim Chiu? Can I take photo with you? I said, wow, can, can, no problem, sure. Take photo, take photo, take photo. So it's called the power of branding. You cannot, you wait, wait for Darth Vader to ask you, are you Elim Chiu? Take photo with you. So, it's, it's really wonderful, but the only thing is, Darth Vader got Singapore accent. Yeah, so he said, can I take photo with you? Yeah, so thank you very much. I hope that you can, can qualify. That was great. Thank you so much. I'll take course with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chu, for that great joke. We should we should actually consider doing a collab or something, right? One day, yeah. So, so now that the opening speech has been made, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the Junior World Entrepreneurship Forum 2014. Once again, my name is Brian. And I'm Valerie. And we will be your hosts for the next couple of days. No escaping us here. So we are very proud and happy to see a huge, aspiring group of people right here. So how are you folks doing? Oh, can I? Okay, can that, that's a, a little bit louder? No, okay. I like you guys there, somewhere there. Okay. We will work on this. Okay, yeah. Valerie, I'm sure that there are people here who might be a bit new to the JWEF. So could you just tell a little background on this wonderful event we have? Sure. <clears throat> so well, Brian and everyone here. So formed in 2008, the Junior World Entrepreneurship Forum is basically a global community of aspiring young students and entrepreneurs. As an initiative derived from the World Entrepreneurship Forum, the JWEF aims to promote and accelerate youth entrepreneurship globally as a way to create wealth and social justice. Hmm, interesting. Big words, but, but I get the gist of it. It's basically um, encouraging and helping out aspiring entrepreneurs just like yourself. That's right, and this could not have been possible without our lovely sponsors, Blue Energy Music, Showbox, Graham, and Rachta Lin. Also, just a heads up, right after this, we actually have the white paper discussion, but before that, we have a speech. So listen up and you know you can create, you can gather these nuggets of wisdom so that you can use them during your discussion later on. Yep, coming right up, we've got the first of many talks that we're going to have in these two days. I'm sure you all have been waiting eagerly for this. So Valerie, why don't you let the cat out of the bag for the first speaker? Again, so to answer your question, Brian, the first speaker we have today is the founder of Play Nation, Ms. Wong Kai Jin. Ms. Wong began Play Nation in 2009 and building the company on the basis of sustainability and scalability as its core foundation. She also invests much of her time in developing human capital within Play Nation. Thank you very much, Valerie. Now let us put our hands together to welcome Ms. Wong Kai Jin. Hi, actually, um, I just feel that it's not right to be me alone speaking because uh, with every entrepreneurship, there's a team behind it. Okay, so I brought my founding team with me today. My co-founder, Mr. Gabriel Liao, and uh, my third partner who joined us two years ago, Ms. Wong Kai Okay, um, there's a reason why the three of us chose to spend time this morning speaking to you guys because entrepreneurship is something that is very close to my heart and I feel that the youths are the tomorrow of Singapore. And just five years ago, I was about your age. I did, uh, I started up Play Nation when I was 25. That was in 2009. So now it's 2014 already. Just five years ago, I was your age, dreaming about how I can make my entrepreneur dream come true. 
So we fast forward five years down the road. Uh, it's a journey that I think we never imagined. It was very tough. But hey, guess what? We're still living our dream. <laughs> and so um, I don't really want to do a lot of talking. I made the slides uh, interesting, colorful, so you guys won't be bored. So um, let's just go through what Play Nation have done over the last few years. Can we have the video, please?
So you basically just look at five years of my life in the last five minutes. <laughs> okay, um, just before I start it, I, um, my partner Carling, she was with PricewaterhouseCoopers for about eight years, specializing in mergers and acquisitions, before she decided to drop her high-flying career, give up her five-figure salary to come and chart the play nation journey with us. And uh, Mr. Gabriel Liao, when we started in 2009, he was my first partner. There was only the two of us then. Uh, he previously worked with Nielsen after graduating from uh, NTU. Uh, he was a student of Professor Hui Den Huan. So it's a small world. We are all students of Professor Hui Den Huan, actually. <laughs> okay. And uh, just before I start, I just uh, wanted to say, I didn't know about the skate story and all the hard work behind it, but we have been at skate for about three years, four years, and uh, we are very grateful for the opportunity that Skate and Elim and anyone else who has given us. Because without Skate, we will never have the Play Nation that we are having now. So, I read a lot ever since I started my entrepreneur journey. I read into how other people succeed, I read into what makes a good company, and I felt that this particular phrase from Jim Rogers really captured how I felt about my entrepreneurship journey when I just started out. Jim Rogers is a legendary investor, co-founder of Quantum Fund. He retired at 37 years old. He's, he was very famous because he worked with George Soros. So that's what he said. He said, this, this was uh, written in a book for his children. He's now 50, 60 years old already. So he said, when you begin something, you may not have a concrete picture or vision of the future. But if you continue to be passionate, and work hard at what you truly love to do. I highlighted and bold the words that were important. Then you will eventually find that dream. And that dream will morph into yet another dream, and another dream, and another dream. And that's exactly what Play Nation has gone through the last few years. In addressing the issues of being an entrepreneur, I actually spent a, a lot of time last night thinking through our slides and thinking of how to convey this message to the young people. I feel that there are a lot of challenges for young people these days to be a startup. You are here today, it means you want to be an entrepreneur, or at least you believe that being an entrepreneur is something that you want to do. But then, the reality is that there's a lot of challenges facing you. First of all, you have a challenge determining the right business concept. You don't know whether that particular business will work for you. And then you have difficulties, finding the right partners and you also run into human resource and financing constraints because you're so young nobody want to work for you and this is real it took us three years to build a team of 30 we had our first retreat only when we could afford it in the third year of our startup journey but in the fourth year my 30 packs quit and i had a team of 30 leaving and i had to pick up the pieces that was left behind and rebuild my team from scratch so HR constraint is a real constraint. How do you inspire other people to continuously follow you? Not just for one year, three years, five years, but 30 years of your life. Okay? And then we have um, what is most challenging for myself. I started when I was 25 years old. I was idealistic. I was ambitious. I thought I could own the world. <laughs> and when I started out a, a business, I realized that, hey, things don't work the way I think it was. I can't do everything in the world, right? I can have dreams, but those dreams take time to fulfill. So, idealism versus realism. When you come to reality with what is happening in this world and how the world functions, how do you want to adjust yourself to suit the world and play the game well? And lastly, there's a difference between starting a business and staying in business. Starting a business is challenging, but it's the easiest part. Staying in business is the real challenge. It's going to follow you through your life. <laughs> Actually, I didn't develop this model. James Colin developed it in a book called Good to Great. If you really want to start a business, go and read Build to Last and uh, read Good to Great. On hindsight, we realized that we were doing it right, but when I came across this model, I felt, wow, that really succinctly summarized how to find the right business concept. There's only three simple principles. First of all, you ask yourself, what can you be the best in the world at? 
That means being very honest and truthful, looking inside and asking yourself, what is it that you can do that other people cannot do? So, Elim is right about her 10,000 hours. I love the 10,000 hours analogy. If you put your heart into doing something that you are good at for 10,000 hours, you become the best. But just finding what you are best at in this world is not enough. Because even if you can be the best at something and make money out of it, without the intrinsic passion, what you are deeply passionate about, you can't make money forever. Right? So you have what you can be the best at in this world. You have the intrinsic passion. But if what you do doesn't make money, then you're going to have a lot of fun. But you're not going to survive. And therefore, the last portion, how are you going to monetize your concept and make sure that it makes enough money for you to continuously pursue your passion and do what you are good at? You need to combine these three things and think about a business model that enables you to do all these three things together. And when Gabriel and I started out, we didn't plan for success. We planned not to fail. That means that we had about one year cash flow stored up and we were so concerned about not failing, we were paranoid. But what didn't struck us is what happens if we succeed? So on hindsight, if I were to redo this all again, I would think, if I want to start a business, what's the five year plan that I have it? What's the 10 years plan? What do I do when my competitors catch up? Finding the right partners uh, is uh, one of the most challenging things. I used to be a student down there and during networking sessions, I feel that it was just networking. I wasn't interested in it. I was so wrong. Finding the right partners is the most important thing you can do for yourself if you want to have a career in entrepreneurship. I have over my last five years seen so many fantastic business models making good money, but eventually the business failed, they wind up, not because the business wasn't making money, but because the partners fell out. It is real. If you break it down into pieces, entrepreneurship is about a team of people working together. And unless that team of people can work well together, you're going to quarrel. You're going to break under the pressure. If you don't make money, you quarrel. If you make money, you quarrel even more. <laughs> Right? If you don't make money, you quarrel because you can't make money. But if you make money, you quarrel because you don't know how to distribute the profit. Should I take more and buy beautiful houses or should I keep the money with the company and grow the company? So these are real issues and the thing that matters and make or breaks a partnership. So in finding the right partners, sorry, I need to go back. Eh? <laughs> you need to ask yourself, in this partner that you are selecting, is that partner adding skill sets and experience to your team? This is particularly important if you start out young. When you are 20 to 25 years old, you don't have a lot of experience managing the world. If I were to redo my entrepreneur journey, I would like someone who is 40 years old or 50 years old on my team. We were fortunate because subsequently my ex-bosses is now acting as mentor to us. Luckily, I didn't burn bridges when I leave my company. So point to note for all those uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, if you, it's good to have some job experience. When you leave, please don't burn bridges. You never know when they'll come back and help you. Okay? And these partners have valuable networks. Without them, because when you're not at that age, you don't know the people that can really make decisions. Without them, we can't have PricewaterhouseCoopers in our portfolio. Without them, we can't have ExxonMobil in our portfolio. So these are the kind of people who actually add their network and experience into the startup team that makes it work. And secondly, you need to ask yourself, does your partner add resource or network to your team? Unlike in a school, right, when you're doing teamwork, you like to find people who are like-minded. In an entrepreneurship career, you need to add one more criteria. You need to find people who are like-minded, but who have different skill sets from you. So if you are someone who is very good at the numbers, find someone who is strong in marketing. If you are someone who is strong in marketing, find someone who is strong in IT. Entrepreneurship is a team effort. No matter how good you are, you can't do everything by yourself. So if you can find partners that think like-minded, but have different skill sets from yours, then grab him. And if you can find a rich partner who has money, grab him too. <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> okay, the third point is often 
not spoken, but is your partner able to put business interest above self-interest? As your company grows, you're going to have a real problem. Your company starts to make money. If your partner is someone that's very self-interested, he will say, okay, let's split out the money and put it inside our pocket. But you need retainers to grow the company. So you need to put the money back into the business to grow the business. What is his expectations of this? You need to find someone who shares similar expectations of personal growth versus company growth as you. Okay? And that comes to the next important point. What is their salary or profit sharing expectations? <sighs> At this point in time, I must let out a big sigh. Why? Because when I started out this entrepreneur journey career, I thought that I'll be very rich in five years' time. Now it's the fifth year and I say, oh, I'm all wrong. When you just start out, you will not be rich. Full stop. Unless you have a very rich father or a very rich uh, family, then that's a different thing. But when you start out, you scream and save, and on months, initially when we start out, we just survive on, I think, $500 a month. Some of the entrepreneurs that I've met told me that that's a lot of money because they start out not giving salaries to themselves. And you have to survive with a $500 salary a month the pain of nobody doing the job for you and still hang on to your dream. Can you find someone that can work like that? Can you find someone who shares the same aspiration and the same value with you? That is very important in the startup phase. Okay, and lastly, how do we react to conflict and adversity? In a partnership, we are talking about many people coming together. Uh. So people A has people A's personality, people B has people B's personality, and you will confirm quarrel. I don't even want to lie. The three of us quarrel like mad over issues. Okay? But the key issue is, after all the quarrels, even if it hurts you personally, do you continue to stay and build the business, or you give up and walk away? That's the key difference in whether or not your organization will succeed. I don't have more slides already. I'm going to pass the, the, the thing over to my partner. So can we have the next slide? I just want to end this point about finding the right partners. James Collin did a study on a company's leadership. He studied over 1,000 companies, and he studied why some, some companies were good while other companies were great. And this is his finding. Say you need partners who argue and debate, sometimes violently in pursuit of the best answer. Yet after all the debate, they are able to unify behind the decision regardless of parochial interest. So just remember having the right partners is important. And with that, I pass it on to my next partner. Okay, uh, thank you for the very uh, semi-entertaining speech. Uh, I'm not going to talk about a lot of the technical things. So, there's many challenges in being an entrepreneur. Uh, today, I just want to talk about specifically what I think is the three main hurdles for youth entrepreneurs when we first start out. Uh, I think Hajim was right. I actually spent eight years in a corporate career. And I spent eight years because, like many of you down there, I didn't know whether I had what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And at the back of my mind, I was especially worried about these three things behind me, okay, which, which I'm going to talk about in small little stories later. I was worried whether I was able to manage a team and lead a team. So that was my human resource worry. I was very worried about whether I would have enough money in my pocket to make ends meet. And that if my employees started to have families and started to have their life moments, would I be able to pay them enough and still be the leader that I am to them today? And more importantly, I was worried because I was only 25 years old. I, I didn't know about the world. I didn't know how to move things. Uh, we started from a very humble background, so we didn't have uh, much in our pocket. Our very first startup capital was actually self-finance. So Kaji worked for four years with PricewaterhouseCoopers, Gabriel worked for a while with uh, Nielsen, and uh, I worked for eight years with PricewaterhouseCoopers. So during those years, we spent a lot of time trying to save up to have the first sum of money, and then we borrowed, we borrowed from relatives, I think that these are very real things, to fund the first pool of capital that we had for the business. What I think the first set of challenge you will have as a youth entrepreneur is that you're 25 years old, you're gonna have a lot of employees 
who's going to come to you and they're just probably around the same age or just a few years younger than you and they will look at you. They debate with you over every decision that you're going to